So now if we have electric fields and they have field lines and there are vector functions, of course, we can try to find the flux of our electric field. Now, as you can see, the electric field sort of radiates out in a sort of spherical shape. So let's look at the flux around a certain charge emitting these electric fields on a spherical surface. So if I have a charge lying in the middle, I can surround it using a spherical surface and there'll be some flux going through it. And assuming that the center of this sphere is just where the charge is, at any location on the sphere, the electric field will be radiating directly outwards and so will the area vector at that particular location. So if we were to take any of the small area on our sphere, the flux could just simply be easily evaluated as the electric field at that location times the magnitude of the area because the cosine terms will disappear because theta will be zero for this example. If we apply this for the entire sphere, then the flux will just be equal to the magnitude of the electric field at the sphere multiplied by the total area of the sphere. Since the electric field at any location on the sphere will have to be the same. We know what the equation for electric field is, and that's according to Coulomb's law that we have talked about earlier. The surface area of a sphere is given by four pi r squared. And so we can work out the total flux. That total flux would just be equal to some constant multiplied by the charge in the middle. Hold on, this feels interesting because we can see here that the flux doesn't actually depend on the size of our sphere. And that should make sense because the electric field is inversely proportional to the radius squared, whereas the surface area of the sphere is proportional to the radius squared. So these two will sort of have to cancel each other out. And so how much ever large our sphere is, it doesn't actually affect the amount of flux going through our sphere. And so when we have a spherical shell surrounding a charge right in the middle of the spherical shell, the only thing that will affect the total flux through that sphere will be the magnitude of our charge. But what if the volume surrounding our charge is no longer a sphere? Well, let's do this. Let's say we have our sphere here and we'll divide them all up into equal pieces. Now, since our shape here is perfectly symmetrical and there's just no reason that there should be unequal flux at any point on our sphere, we can say that the flux through each of our divided pieces will have to be the same. Now let's get a bigger sphere, a slightly bigger sphere, and we divide them up into the exact same number of pieces. By the same lines of argument that I've mentioned, the amount of flux through each of the pieces on this sphere will have to be the same as well. And it'll be the same as the amount of flux through each of the pieces on our smaller sphere. So if I take one of the piece of the smaller sphere and I replace it with this larger one, so that now our shape looks a bit like this, the amount of flux will still be the same through our shape. And in fact, I can keep doing something like this with our actual shape. I can go mental with it. I can create any sort of volume I want. But the most important thing is that the flux through that volume will still be the same. The thing is, the amount of flux through our volume doesn't actually depend on the shape of our volume itself. So it seems like the only thing that is affecting the amount of flux through our volume is the charge that's in the middle. And so really, it doesn't matter what the shape of our sphere is like. And really, it won't matter as well where our charge is lying. It doesn't matter if our charge is lying here or if our charge is lying here. The amount of flux through our shape should still be the same. So what if we don't have a charge in one of those locations, but we instead have a charge on both of those locations? Now, what is the amount of flux? It turns out that the flux caused by the electric fields from both of these charges will be the same as the flux caused by the electric field of this particle, plus the flux caused by the electric field from this particle. In other words, flux can be added together. And that goes down to the fact that electric field itself can be added together. 
and the way that we find flux just means that this property will carry on also into the flux. And so it turns out that the total flux through this surface here will really only depend on the amount of charge that it is surrounding. And so we can write this mathematically, that the total flux through our closed surface will be proportional to the size of charge it surrounds and just the size of charge and nothing to do with the actual shape of our volume. And to get rid of this proportionality sign, we can just introduce a constant of proportionality, which will be one over epsilon naught, where this epsilon naught is something called the permittivity of free space. This right here is something called Gauss's law. Now, from the way that I've talked about Gauss's law in this video, most of you might think that Gauss's law is a consequence of Coulomb's law, and hence Coulomb's law seems to be the more fundamental law which leads to something like Gauss's law. However, in reality, both of these laws are sort of equivalent of each other, and in fact many people might even argue that Gauss's law in fact is the more fundamental law, and we can in fact use Gauss's law to prove Coulomb's law. So to recap, Gauss's law basically says that the total flux through a closed surface will only depend on the amount of charge inside that surface. So if we have a positive charge, there'll be a net positive flux. If we have a negative charge, then we will have a net negative flux. If we don't have that many charge, then there won't be that many flux. But if we have a lot of charge, then there'll be a lot more flux. And if we have no net charge, or if we have equal amounts of positive and negative charge, then the total amount of flux will be zero. And if we have a single charge, which just happens to be outside our volume, then there will still be no net flux. Now, this form of Gauss's law is what we call the integral form. There is another way that we can describe Gauss's law. So far, we've been talking about this charge as just very discrete point charges in space. But we might actually come and encounter cases where this charge is not just points in space, but in fact smeared over a larger volume like this. So if the surface that we're considering is just the surface of this shape, how can we find the total charge that is enclosed by this shape? Well, we'd have to talk about something called the charge density. Well, regular density that you might see in elementary physics will just be the amount of mass per volume in space. And charge density is basically the same idea, but rather than describing the mass per volume, it describes the amount of charge in any particular volume. So if we have this surrounded volume here, we could divide each of the volumes up into smaller volumes. And for each of those small volumes, the amount of charge that volume will just equal to the charge density times the actual volume of that box. And so to find the total charge for the entire volume, we can just sum the amount of charge in each of those boxes up. And if those boxes are infinitesimally small, then we can make this instead an integral. And so the total charge now will become the integral of the charge density over the entire volume. And so the flux through our closed volume can be rewritten as such. But we can still rewrite it in another way, because last video we've learned about something called the divergence theorem. And by the divergence theorem, this will be equal to the integral of divergence of the electric field across the entire volume. And as you can see here, these two things will be equal to each other, which means that the integrand must be equal to each other. And we have derived that the other form of Gauss's law, that the divergence of the electric field will be equal to the charge density divided by the permittivity of free space. And this form of Gauss's law is also quite interesting to look at because it's basically saying how much of the electric field diverges from a particular point depends on how concentrated the charge is at that particular point. If there's a positive charge there, the field will sort of diverge out. And if there's more charge there, the field will diverge out even more, there'll be more fields coming out from that point. And if the charge at that point is negative, or the charge density is negative, then the field would sort of be going into that particular point. And we know that this will match what we know about electric fields, and also what we know about divergence 
effective field in general. And so there we have it, the two forms of Gauss's law.